we've been in, uh, in Acts, and we're talking about dealing with conflict, which is, I, uh, I think is a, 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 good, a good topic to be talking about in our days uh, with uh, still the COVID stuff going on and, and then the stuff going on in Ukraine. Uh, kind of on just a note, I, myself, I am struggling quite a lot with, um, and I know it's my personality. I have a personality bent on, on truth and what is right. And if something isn't right, I struggle very hard to, um, to, to write that, to, to make it make sense in my mind and heart. And uh, I'm um, talking about the Ukraine thing and, and what to do about that. I'm, uh, I've been praying about it a lot. Uh, that's not right what's going on there. And, uh, and good men, when good men do nothing, evil wins. And so I've been struggling in my heart with that and then going to Scripture as I'm reading this and recognizing the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, recognizing that I am an enemy. Uh, my sister sent me a text, an enemy of God without Christ. There we go. I need to finish my sentences. I'm assuming you just... I shouldn't assume that. Um, my sister sent me a text, and she's like, uh, it's interesting. She's like, what I'm seeing is that the enemy is relentless, you know, and uh, she's listening to what's going on, and not only is there this campaign of, of attack, a little, literally a physical, you know, attack, but there's also this, like, all behind background stuff with media and with false truth and with lies, and she's like, what I'm, she's like, my sister just said, you know, it's, it's, uh, it makes me aware how how relentless the enemy can be. And then, obviously, she's connecting that with the spiritual forces of evil, right? Um, Hitler kind of did the same thing. Putin lying to his people. There's a personal agenda. There's, a, there's a lies and confusion and all sorts of different things going on. Uh, and we have to recognize that, you know, I think we don't realize that Satan is engaged in those things. Man isn't doing something that's... that's well, man knows how to fight war, but Satan doesn't. He's a fool, and we don't have to worry about him. I, I don't think that's a good place to stand. In fact, if we can see how relentless man can be as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be that much more aware of how relentless Satan is also being in our day. And if Satan, as the enemy, is so profoundly relentless... Uh, we should be engaged in fighting him, right? And if we look at ourselves, you've got to ask yourself the question, in the conflict for the hearts and souls of man, does it feel like my day-to-day -day life is in times of war and conflict, or do I feel like I'm kind of in a time of peace? Now, the peace of Jesus Christ we can have no matter what. But our lives as warriors and as followers and as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be living so much in a time of peace when it comes to that battle with, with, uh, with darkness. And so in my own life, I'm, I'm struggling through some of those things. And so the topic of conflict, I, I think, is, uh, is, a, is a good topic for us to be studying this, this, the last several weeks. Uh, last week, we are, uh, we are again still in chapter 15. Uh, we're talking about the Jerusalem Council. Um, last week, we looked at the eighth kind of uh, key action that we should be engaged in in conflict, and that is our, when we're engaged in conflict, we should be willing to bring the conflict to the cross, and this thing means that our aim in our conflicts with our wives, with our kids, with our husbands, with our neighbors, with the people at work, with even greater conflicts, uh, with our government, our angst towards uh, what's going on and, and the, the liberal and the, all that kind of stuff, but even with COVID and stuff, in conflict, we need to be first and foremost guard our hearts to make sure that we are willing to bring the conflict to the cross, meaning that we're not about just and setting ourselves in a position where we prove ourselves right, but rather we are aiming for holiness. We are acting in love, and we are intentionally working towards restoration and unity with the people that we are engaged in conflict with. That is hard to do. It's hard to remember. But as followers of Jesus Christ, because He lives in us, when we engage in conflict, we need to be willing to bring the conflict to the cross. Aim for holiness, love, and restoration and unity. 
this morning. And we are, um, I'm kind of just going to jump into Acts 15, and we're going to start in verse 22. But a quick recap, where Acts 15 is talking about the Jerusalem Council, where Paul, Barnabas, and Peter, and we also see James now, are trying to clarify that, that people that, uh, that are saved by Jesus Christ are saved by Jesus Christ by faith alone, right? By belief and faith alone. And the other side of the conflict are the Pharisees, uh, Christian Pharisees, but are, they're standing up and saying, no, the Gentiles have to be circumcised, they have to follow the law and believe in Jesus in order to be saved. And so that's where the, the, the conflict is at. And we are getting already, we've heard last week already, James standing up and saying, okay, this is what, this is what we conclude. And uh, in, in, in verse 22, this is James speaking, and he clarifies, he just finishes clarifying that we're going to send the letter. This is what it's going to say. And now we are jumping into that, that um, right after that, okay? So in verse 22, let's jump in. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church, verse 22, decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who are leaders among the believers. The, with them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, elders your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose, so we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Bar Barnabas and Paul, men who risked their lives for the, for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So now we're going to jump into this idea of conflict, and what do we glean from this passage? First, we see that in verse 23, they sent a letter. They write down, they write down what their verdict is. So number nine action in dealing with conflict is write it so they can read it. Now, I mean, if you're in a conflict with your, with your husband or with your wife, and you're just like constantly writing down everything, that might make a con conflict, okay? That might grow the conflict. Be like, honey, seriously, I said it once, I said it a hundred times, there's a thousand sticky notes by your bed, okay? Clean up your shorts, okay? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm enough, right? That might be a problem, okay? That might create more pro problems. But in conflict, okay, and generally in conflict, we should write it. The, the early church, they, they write down what they are doing. And you might feel like, okay, well, this seems very unspiritual. This doesn't really seem like a very spiritually, you know, uh, enriching point, but, but pay attention to this. There, there is actually a pretty clear evidence in Scripture that writing it down for clarity is actually a pretty good way to go. Hopefully you're kind of seeing a connection here. I've given you the answer in my statement there. This actually is a, a fairly spiritually enriching truth. Write it so they can read it. Why? Because when writing it down... It adds clarity, but it also creates accountability. It also creates accountability. Writing, writing down the, the answer, pay attention to, they write down two things. They write down clearly what happened, and then they write down clearly the verdict. They write down what happened. They're writing down what caused the conflict, right? Remember what it said right there in verse 24? We have heard that some went out from us without our, 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 our authorization and disturbed you, 
troubling your minds by what they said. So they're being clear about what the conflict was about. And then they're also being clear about what the results of that were. We do this in the court of law today. We have a, a little person, I shouldn't be say a little person, we have a person, you know, recording everything that goes on. We see the early church fathers doing this here, but I also want you to note, and this is the point, God does this. God does this. So this is actually a very spiritual point. And why does God do this? He is very clear about two things. So that the heart of man is held accountable. One, what the conflict is about. God says, I'm a holy God. This way is good. But you're a sinful people that always go that way. You always go your own way. And none of you, none of you on your own are following after my way. God is very clear about the issue. Why? So that man is held accountable. Now that is not just sinful man. That's, all, that's also every one of us in this room who know Jesus Christ. You won't be able to stand before God and say, What? I didn't know that I was kind of selfish. What? I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be a part of a church and engage in making disciples. I didn't know that. I didn't know that I was supposed to be loving my neighbor. I didn't know that. None of us will be able to do that. Why? Because God writes it so that we can read it, and He is very clear about what has caused the conflict between us and God. And he is very clear about the solution or the verdict to that conflict. And the verdict to that conflict is belief and trust in Jesus Christ and walking with a repentive heart after Jesus. Right? Suddenly it seems like, hmm, this is actually a very spiritual point. It's a very spiritual point. There is something very valuable in that. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, things that, like tons of things that we don't understand. I was just watching a video this morning about the expansion of the universe. Won't get into it, obviously, because I have no idea what. <laughs> so the, the universe is actually larger than it should be if you calculate it by the distance of uh, the light can travel at the speed of light, right, and all that stuff, and they're explaining why. I understand, like, two, it's bigger than it should be. I got that. Okay. Everything else, don't really get. I don't even know why. Ah, it's interesting stuff. That's what I was going to say. I don't even know why I watch those videos. It just makes me realize how much of a more I, I am. But there's much we don't even comprehend at all about how brilliant that God is. Right? But yet, he still very clearly takes time to write it down so that we can read it and understand the main points and so that we are held accountable to him and how we live. Applicationally, applicationally, in this truth, it points to the importance of us knowing the Word of God. It points to the importance of us understanding the Word of God, right? And it points for, to us the importance of encouraging others to read it, but also to hold ourselves accountable and to hold others accountable to this truth. Because this is very clear about what one day what is going to happen with all those that don't follow after Jesus Christ, right? That is also clear in this. And we should be engaged in reading it and living it and understanding the severity of what this, the conclusion of what this is, the verdict of what this is. So, in conflict, right? Now, I, I'm a, every little conflict, I, I think oh, you're right. We don't need to write things down. But I think in, in, in many conflicts, it's not a bad idea for us to write down in clarity what took place, and also as we're working towards kind of resolving that conflict, write down very clearly what that resolution is, so that in the future, people are held accountable to that. People are held accountable to that. Write it so that they can read it. It's quite a practical one but yet a practical truth that still holds some profound 
spiritual reality for us. Moving on. Point number 10. For point number 10, let's jump into verse 25 and 27 look at it a little bit more closely. Let's listen to what uh, is said here. Verse 25 in, in Acts 15. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 27, therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what was written. The council sends a letter and, and sends back Paul and Barnabas, but also sends two of their own people. By doing this, they are ensuring that no one in the church of Antioch would be able to discredit or ignore the truth. James and the church council are making sure everyone knows exactly what happened and want to be very clear about the verdict. Now, this is very connected to the writing it down, right? But I want you to note the triple, they are making triple sure. They are making triple sure. Okay, and then you got to connect this too with our understanding of what God is doing as well, okay? So I want you to see that in here. So they are sending back Paul and, Paul and, Paul and Barnabas. But just sending back Paul and Barnabas might seem like to the Antioch church and maybe even those people in Antioch who first made this an issue, right? The people that first were preaching and teaching, no, you have to be circumcised. It might seem like, well, Paul and Barnabas aren't actually necessarily being honest, and they're just coming back and saying, see, we're right. So then the church of Antioch doesn't want that, so they're going to send back, or the, sorry, the church council in Jerusalem doesn't want that, so they're going to send back Paul and Barnabas. Then they're also going to send back a letter clarifying, and then they're also going to send back two of their own to, to, to confirm by word of mouth what is going on. And we know that they're very careful to clarify what is going on because we all, as we already read in verse 24, it says, we have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. Note that James and the council are not trying to hide what happened. They are not trying to help the men in Antioch who started this big debate save face. Everyone's going to know who's wrong, right? They also don't try to protect their own reputation. James is clear. These people were from us. Though, though they went out without authorization. So he's clear. He's not trying to say, well, we, you know, what are we supposed to do? This had nothing to do with us. No, he's clear. He takes responsibility. He's not trying to cover up his own reputation or their own reputation, but they want to make sure that what takes place is a clear understanding of all that went on. They are triple checking to be open and honest and clear. In conflict, we too should be triple checking to be open, honest, and clear. We need to be engaged in that. And again, this seems kind of like a pretty practical pretty unspiritual notion, but there is some real uh, challenging truth in this. They want to make sure that those in Antioch understand the issue and the verdict, and they're making triple sure that that happens. So often in Christ Christian circles, do we do the same? Do we make sure that we are open that we take the responsibility that we should take, that we are honest, and that we are clear to the people around us what has taken place. So often in Christian circles, we try to hide the issue, keep all the problems secret, and of course that fails because normally what happens is that as much as we try to keep things secret, things get out, little things get out. And of course, as those little things get out, people have to draw their own conclusions, so they end up drawing their own conclusions. And so often, because we're human, the conclusions we draw are often worse. And Satan uses that gossip and that, those stories to, to bring more destruction than what would be the case if we were just careful to be open, honest, and clear. In application here, I want to note three things. One... When we are trying to hide something, when you are trying to hide your solution or keep your verdict a secret, 
whether it's uh, directly connected to conflict or anything, guys, it is wise to think, if I am trying to keep something secret, there is something wrong with that. Now, if, if, you're, if you're planning a surprise party or something for your wife, you get me, right? Like, I don't have to kind of explain this. But the things that you know that you want to keep secret for moral reasons... Because isn't that what we so do with sin? When we know that we're not in the right place, the first thing that we want to do is keep it secret. I've talked about this lots. The Word of God talks about this lots. I have uh, have even, I've I've seen um, and experienced and heard of churches where there's conflict and issue. And what the leadership does is that they aim to keep it secret, to keep it quiet, so that no one really knows what actually took place. I've heard of Christians in leadership uh, making and even forcing other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ to sign legal documents to make sure everything stays secret and claiming that that honors God or somehow protects God's name or protects the church. Let me be clear. We don't have an example in Scripture where dealing with conflict and sin is dealt with in a way that it's kept secret that honors God. If it's connected to sin, we don't have an example anywhere where keeping it secret is God-honoring. And now you might say, well, how about Matthew 18, 15 to 17? Okay, let's read that. We're going to go through that this morning because I think this is so important. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Now, this is how believers in Jesus Christ should engage engage kind of the conflict, especially connected to sin in the Word of God. Listen to Matthew 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Now, this is where many people go, ha-ha, see, it's secret, right? But let's keep reading, okay? I want, to, I want you to, to, to ask yourself this question. Is the intention of this verse secrecy? Listen to what it says. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So if, you, if they listen, you win them over. What does that mean? It, it's recognizing, it means that they recognize their sin, that they repent, that it's dealt with between you and them and Jesus Christ because that's what matters in sin. Now, does everyone else need to know about it? No, it seems like if you're going to go talk to someone who's walking in sin and you're endeavoring to work that out, the whole world doesn't need to, 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 to hear about it. It is ironic that so often when we see someone walking in sin, we go tell four other people and we want to keep it quiet though, right? We want to keep this secret though. And the, you know, oftentimes the last person is the, is, is the person that we, that we actually need to go talk to, that person, because that's a scary conversation to have with our brothers and sisters, right? I think it's a scary conversation, right? Uh, working with, uh, at NBC, there was lots of times where you would see sin in someone's life. And as the dean of, dean of, of, of men and then the dean of students, I, I was like, it was, it was my job. It was my calling to go and talk to them about that. And I, I hated that. It, 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 was, it didn't just, oh, I see that. Oh, I'm going to go right, right there. That's not... That's not how you do that well. It was usually like days of prayer and unfortunately sometimes weeks and months of like praying and being like, okay, I see this and, but I don't want to destroy this relationship because that's the first thing you think is going to happen, right? But we are called to go to them and to talk to them, but the aim of this passage isn't secrecy. The aim of this passage is repentance and restoration in Jesus Christ. It's funny that we read that passage and we automatically want to go to secrecy. See, that's secrecy. That the intention of that is not secrecy. And we should actually guard our hearts and ask ourselves, why? Why Why am I so focused on secrecy? Why am I so drawn to that idea of being in the darkness, making sure no one sees what's really there? So what happens if they don't listen? We continue. But if they do not listen... 
Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Again, we can say, well, this looks like secrecy, but is the intent secrecy? The intent isn't secrecy, again. The intent is so that the matter is established, made clear, understood, brought to light by two or three witnesses. Note again, the aim here is not secrecy, first and foremost, but, trust, but truth established and repentance found. But then why, what, what if they still aren't willing to listen? Verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Does that sound like the intention is secrecy? And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So if they are not willing to listen, then tell it to the church. And note that many, many commentaries here, okay, say church, what this means is church leadership. Maybe the pastor and one of the other elders, that's it. Is that what it says here? No. That's not what it says here. Right? Jesus uses, and Matthew records the word church. Do you hear that? Jesus says, and Matthew records the word church. Why is that unique? Because at this time when Jesus was speaking, he had not died on the cross and risen again. The, he had not been on earth for 40 days. He had not ascended into heaven, and then the, the apostles had not waited yet for the beginning, really, of the church to take place on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came down and filled the disciples and filled the people, and Peter preached, and all the stuff that we've talked about as we've gone through Acts have taken place. So really, the church wasn't really what the church wasn't really established yet. But here Jesus is being very clear. The word means the gathering or the congregation. You could say the, 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 the gathering of believers. If Matthew or Jesus wanted to strictly uh, um, say the leadership or the pastor or just the elders, he could have here. There's words for that. But he says to the church, his statement clarifies the public nature of what Jesus is instructing. And this actually aligns very well to 1 Timothy 20, 20, 20. Sorry, 20, 20, 2, 20. Sorry, forgive me. 2 Timothy 2, 20. And it says this, But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone, so that the others may take warning. Man, if we started to do that, wouldn't it be hard to find elders in our churches? The nature of what is said here connects... He's talking about elders specifically there. But the nature of what, what um, is being said aligns to Matthew and it aligns well to Acts 15 and what the church did. If people are sinning and refusing to repent, there is a point where it is dealt with publicly. The second applicational point is that I want to talk about then is, do you struggle with that thought? Do you struggle with that thought? This idea that, okay, so if someone comes to me, right? Say Calvin comes to me and says, Adam, there's sin in your life here. You need to change this. Maybe he, he catches me in a, a, some sin. This needs to change. And I go, oh, no, forget it. It's not that bad. So then he comes to me with a couple, a couple other brothers. And two or three of them say, Adam, this is sin. This needs to change. I'm sorry, forget you, I'm not changing that. It's okay. And then I go to church three or four weeks later, and the pastor stands up, and, or one of the elders stands up and says, guys, we've, uh, we've talked to Adam several times about this sin, but he's unwilling to, to change. And so now we have to take action. But we want you to know what has taken place. Openness. This is the sin. This is what happened. Calvin talked to him. He's unwilling to change. Right? Does that scare you? I think many of us look at that and go, I don't want, why? Why does it scare you? 
Well, I don't want that to happen to me. I mean, I wouldn't be going to a church that, that actually did that. Shockingly, held accountable. Held accountable. It's in here. It's written so that we're held accountable. Right? But I wouldn't go to a church that does that. I get it. I don't want to be a church that does that. I don't want to be a pastor of a church that has to do that. Unfortunately, if I've given my life to Jesus Christ and I said, okay, Father, this is your word and I will follow it, that's what we're called to do, whether I like it or not. There's lots of stuff in here that I don't really dis I agree with. I don't like it. The one is the husband thing. He's the leader. Okay, cool. Like Jesus leads the church. Crack. You know what Jesus did for the church? He died for the church. So that means in every interaction, and I fail at this brutally, I'm to lead my wife. I step up and lead my wife. But I also live dying for my wife. I don't really like that. A 50-50 thing would be better, I think. So there's things in here I don't like, but it's beautiful that this is God's word and not Adam's word. This world would be a much different place if we were all trying to live by Adam's word. It'd be worse. So this is God's word, so we listen to it, but I, the truth is I don't really like that idea, but why? Well, because if I sin, I don't want my sin, especially if I'm being ignorant in it, and I'm just like, no, I like it. And if I'm caught in my sin, I don't, I don't want all you guys finding out about it. I would rather go the secrecy way. I would rather interpret Matthew 18 as, see, there needs to be secrecy, people, and I'd love to preach that. But it's not in there. So what is the answer? The answer is, I would rather not the secrecy thing, and I would struggle with that, that happening in a church that I was just freely going to because I don't want my sin to be shared like that. But guys, don't you get the answer to that is not secrecy. The answer to that is living holy. I'm going to say that again. The answer to that is not secrecy. The answer to that is living holy. So we don't try harder, or I, I'm going to share a sin with Kelvin here, and then he better keep it a secret. No. The answer is that I live in holiness. I don't run to secrecy. I run to Jesus Christ in repentance. And when a brother or a sister in Jesus Christ points out something that I am trying to hide, I walk in repentance recognizing that that's an act of love. That, that doesn't make them an enemy, although that's where we often go, and we have this massive conflict with that person. But it makes them trying to live out love. The answer isn't that, well, we need to be more secret, and I should expect my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ to keep my secrets of sin. Do you see that anywhere in here? No, the answer is that I walk in holiness. And when a brother comes to me and says, there is sin in your life, I repent. I turn to the Lord. I ask for forgiveness. And I find freedom. That's where I find freedom. You don't find freedom in the dark. Why? Because at any moment, the light could be turned on. That's not freedom. That's not freedom. No, you find freedom in repentance and walking in the light because the light is already turned on. Jesus Christ is standing there, and he walks in the light, and that's where we live. So the, 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 the angst that we have shouldn't be towards people better keep the secret, but rather our intention should be towards walking in the light. Number three application, though, and thought here. If you are a church leader or a Christian leader and you have come to a verdict for an issue, and you are wanting everyone involved to keep it quiet and hide some sort of aspect of that, 
some sort of aspect of that truth, guys, I, I would encourage you and suggest that you're not actually walking in truth. Like you're trying to hide something for your own purposes. And often that has, I know even in my own life, often that has to do with failure, my own failure in some sort of aspect in the leadership process. That's why we keep things secret. Because if how we handled an issue glorifies God and has brought unity and restoration between me and the other person and between them in Christ and me in Christ, then I don't need to hold on to that and make sure it stays secret because it glorifies God. So if we are walking in that way, we need to be careful to really evaluate our own purposes and intention. James in the early church council triple-checked to make sure there was openness, honesty, and clarity about the issue and the verdict. As believers in Jesus Christ in conflict, as we work through conflict, we need to triple-check to, to make sure there is clarity, that there is openness, honesty, and that it is clear what took place and also the verdict of it. And there is something to be said about guarding, others, people, guarding your brothers and sisters' dignity, right? Guarding their pride. And I don't mean pride like arrogance pride, sin pride, but like guarding their pride in, in a proper way. There's something to be said there. But our intention shouldn't be towards secrecy, but rather to, being, to bring everything out into the light and to walk and live in holiness eager to walk in repentance. Are you eager to walk in repentance? And I smile because <laughs> I'm not eager to walk in repentance. I, I don't like it when someone comes and says, you know what, this is wrong. There's sin here. I get it. But guys, we should be living so closely and so excitedly after, as we follow Jesus Christ, so closely to him that we are eager to walk in repentance that we are eager to walk in repentance. In conflict, we have to triple check to be open, honest, and clear, to make sure that people understand what happened and, under, and, and understand clearly our action and verdict in the situation. As we deal with conflict, let us, as we looked at in the past five Sundays, let us find the fruit of the fight. As we engage in conflict, let us be looking for, looking within us and saying, okay, what is the real issue going on here? Finding the fruit of the fight is about looking within you and taking time to look within the other person and say, okay, what is really going on here? Why am I so uh, about whatever this is? Why does whenever my wife do, does this, why am I so uh, Whenever my, 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 my husband does this, why do I get so uh, What is really going on within me? Find the fruit of the fight. Number two, we, be, we need to be seeking our highest source. That means, guys, we need to be willing to learn, open to learn. Not just jumping in and thinking we already know, but open to learn and to understand everything we can about the issue. So often we go and we jump into conflict, and a huge part of the conflict is, is that we're actually quite ignorant to what has actually taken place, to what is actually going on, but we fight very hard. We need to be open to learning. Number three, we need to pray about it before we fight about it. Recognizing the passage that, that James says in the letter, it was good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Can you say that in your conflicts? The Spirit of God is, is, is at peace with what we've just gone through, with how I dealt with this conflict and also what we've concluded in this conflict. The Spirit of God is at peace. God, you won't know that unless you spend time in prayer. Don't just jump into the fight. Pray about it before you fight about it. Number four, flip the rock. See what's on the other side. And this has to do with you go and talk to the people on the other side. Don't assume you know. You really want to get into conflict with Trudeau? Have you sat down and talked with him yet? Flip the rock means before you stand up and fight him, you go talk to him. It may be a little hard with Trudeau, but... <laughs> But if you can find him. <laughs> but oftentimes, we don't go talk to the other person. We don't, we don't peacefully 
and respectfully actually consider listening to the other person and fully understanding their side. Talk to, flip the rock. Go see what's on the other side. Number five, we need to come together and be open to truth and truthfully open. Let's do conflict openly together, aiming to have everything shared and revealed, even if it's scary. Aim to do conflict together and in truth. Number six, let's test the testimony of the witnesses. Not just believing anyone, but looking at the fruit of their lives and seeing if they are trustworthy witnesses. See if their lives show the fruit of one who walks in truth and walks in step with the Holy Spirit. See if their lives shine Jesus as one walking in love and obedience to Him. That's a witness you can trust. Test the testimony of the witness. And here's a, you know, side note. Test the testimony of your own witness. Are you one that walks in truth, keeps in step with the Spirit, lives out Jesus Christ, walking in love and obedience to Him? Is that your testimony? Number seven, in conflict, we go to the Word as we live out the Word. Yes, we need to support what we believe and what we argue for with the Word of God. But we do it as we live out the Word of God, right? There's many people that can use the Word of God to support their, to support their view, but they lose the conflict because of how they do it. So we go to the Word as we live out the Word, and number eight, we talked about this last week, we bring the conflict to the cross. This means that I check my heart to make sure that my aim is for holiness, that I'm acting in love, and my chief aim is for unity and restoration. And any other purposes, I die to. That's the purpose of the cross. My aim is holiness, love, and unity. And every other purpose, I die to. Number nine, I write about it so they can read about it to, for clarity, but also to keep them accountable to what was decided. And number 10, we triple check to be open, honest, and clear with what is taking place in the co conflict and our verdict towards the conclusion of that conflict. Secrecy and confusion is not an act of holiness. And we need to make sure we are dealing with conflict in such a way that people don't have to assume or guess at what we are aiming for. We need to triple check to be open, honest, and clear, and that what they should see is, what they should see is that we are dependent on Jesus Christ, focused on establishing truth, and dealing with them in love. That is what the open and honest and clarity should reveal. Let us do conflict differently than the world. Let us engage conflict differently than the people around us because Jesus is alive in us. And we know that now that Jesus is alive in us, everything has changed. And I pray that how we do conflict shows that everything has changed because Jesus is alive in us. Let's pray.